So I've been extremely busy over these last few months and I've been a little MIA off of YouTube, but I'm so stoked to be back. And the project scopes that I've been kind of getting for all these projects have been based around the short form social media content for brands. And that's short form advertisements, lifestyle, product, pretty much that whole entire realm right there. It's been a pretty interesting route. It's a little bit different than what I'm normally used to, but it's been really fun and I'm really stoked about it. And since these last few months have been full with these types of projects, I've been able to learn so much on set. I've been able to learn and refine my workflow in the pre-production to production all the way to post to delivery and I feel like I've gotten a lot better at it it's become a lot more streamlined and honestly it's been more fun because I've had more experience under my belt so today I want to share with you guys how I make short form social media content for brands and there's a lot to get into so over these last few years, there's been this rise with social media content. Brands are becoming more aware and more hip, I guess, and they wanna start posting more on social media and investing more in that. There's influencer marketing, there's the longer form campaigns, there's the short form stuff where it lives in one single post, and then there's Instagram reels and TikTok. There's so much going on, but today we're talking about the short form content where it lives in the feed, IG stories, it could live on their website or their YouTube or Vimeo. We're talking about these short form projects that are kind of like the long form ones, in theory and in style, they share a lot of the same characteristics, but they're usually one-off projects where you kick it out, post it, and then you're done, and then you're on to the next one. And with this new niche of content, it's really exciting because now you're able to churn through content. You have stuff that's really pretty. You can have beauty, product, hero shots, campaigns, storytelling, everything can live within 15 to 60 seconds and maybe a little bit longer. And because these things are so short and often easy to produce, it means more brands are catching on to it, which means more work for everyone going around. You're not really seeing smaller brands do the stuff like Yeti, Patagonia, Arcteryx, or North Face or whatever, where they're doing five to 15 minute long stories where there's trips and athletes and trying to sell a product in between all of it. A lot of these are just one-offs. They're super quick to do. You can shoot it in a day, you can shoot it in a week, and the deliverables are usually pretty easy and really short. So it makes the project span a lot shorter. So with every project, before we even get on set or worry about camera gear or lenses or whatever, we have to hash a bunch of things out with the client and production, and we call this pre-production. Pre-production is so important to have a successful project. Even the bare minimum of pre-production is important. It's better than nothing. If you even think about the music, the vibe of the project, even just locations or like the kind of shots that you want to get in those certain locations. Anything that allows you to think ahead and be prepared so you're not surprised on set is going to help you out so much in the long run when you get on set. In general, just being prepared in life will help you succeed. And that's the same for filmmaking. You know what to expect. You know what your job is. You know exactly what you're there for. So when you get blindsided by schedule changes or bad weather or anything bad that goes wrong on set, you can keep a clear head in a clear mind and be able to tackle that obstacle at hand. Now it's time to figure out the actual concept of the piece. You have to figure out the vibe and feel what they want. I need to figure out the intentions from the client so I can make sure that I'm well suited for this project so I'm not blindsided on set being like, uh oh, what are we actually shooting here? I want to be able to know their exact intentions from the style and feel the piece to the music choices to the shot selection. Are we shooting everything gimbal, handheld? Do you want things on a tripod? What's the flow that you're looking for for these deliverables? Because I want to be able to translate what they want into video, into what they can use for social media marketing. That's the end goal here. We are the tool and the medium to make sure all that happens. It's so, so important to be on the same page with them and to be prepared. It's like the saying goes like measure twice, cut once. You don't want to just wing it and hope things go good. Sometimes, I mean, that's what happens with the small budget stuff. But for the bigger ones, you want to make sure that you nail it because you don't want to go back and be like, uh oh, this wasn't what they were looking for. Now we have to either a reshoot it and then they're bummed and then you're probably doing more work for free because you screw that up. B, you don't get hired back and there's no like word of mouth networking that's going on from their end being like, oh, we worked with this videographer. We worked with this editor. They crushed it. You should work with them. No, they'll say a hey, he messed it up. He didn't give us exactly what we were wanting. They're not going to like rant and rave about you and share you around, which that's not what you want. We want to be able to knock it out of the park first try instead of just guessing what they want. But it's so important to have anything from the client that's giving you a sense of direction. So you're not going the complete opposite way. Some of the projects I've been given, it's like, OK, the director and I are guessing what the client wants. And at least we're on the same page. So then we're delivering similar projects. It's kind of like the Shannon projects I've been doing. Both times they just sent us a creative brief. Here's a mood board. Here's what we're looking for. Here's Here's the deliverables. But with that, it's like, okay, like I know exactly what they're looking for based off of this creative brief. Other times brands go a lot crazier and give you an entire list of what they're looking for, which 
I love that. But on the smaller jobs, I usually collaborate with the director and just figuring out, okay, what is our collective vision here? How do we want to make this happen? Either way, I need to have context and intent understood on my side and on their side and to have everything kind of solidified before we actually step on set and start shooting. You got to be prepared. I always thought pre-pro was like this boring thing that you do where you're just typing up scripts and doing all this stuff. Pre-pro is actually really, really, really important because you have these ideas and these shots that you're dreaming up and you have the vibe that's already kind of solidified. It's like, okay, is this going to be a slow, dreamy piece? Or is this piece going to be chaotic and fast paced and we're going to be doing tons of cuts? I'll probably shoot it fully handled because I know each shot's going to live for maybe 12 to 20 frames. And just having that tiny little bit of information will allow me to be on set and think, okay, this whole piece is going to be super fast paced or it's going to be super slow. So I know how to shoot it. I'm not just flying in blind and like, okay, I hope they don't mind all handheld or I hope they don't mind all gimbal because that's just a waste of time but if you know the vibe that they're looking for you're gonna know how to shoot it the most often overlooked thing for a DP or director or whatever is a shot list and a storyboard. I've been on so many jobs that use mood boards, which I think mood boards are fantastic. You kind of get the vibe and feel of it. It helps out a ton for color grading because they pick out all these photos that kind of fit their vibe. So I just match the color grading to that. And with mood boards, we can definitely get the job done. But when you have clients who are very hands-on with the project, they have a lot of intent and specific things that they have in mind. So having a shot list or a storyboard that has their hands in it as well is just gonna make things so much better. Sometimes people will build out a storyboard or a shot list and pitch it but the very best thing that has ever happened is the clients like okay we made a shot list and we made a storyboard for you to follow oh my gosh it is the in oh it's so so good this project i did almost a year ago for baby leto but for this project i had really simple deliverables it was three edits 15 seconds each in 9 by 16 16 by 9 and i think like one by one so just changing the aspect ratios but these glorious people they gave me a shot by shot storyboard for each edit it's like okay here's location one for this one room we need a shot of this this and this 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 six shots all set and done go to the next edit same thing third one same thing it was amazing because when i'm on set I can follow the storyboard just from one shot to another. It's like, okay, I got that, got that, got that. And usually you can knock out those six shots really quickly. But what I found out was that having that storyboard gave me that bare minimum structure where I know if I just get this, they're happy. But for me, I want to be able to knock it out of the park and over deliver. So when I know that I got all the shots, I'm able to get even more pickups. I got pickups of all their other dressers and accessories and more shots with the family than they were expecting. And then what happens next? I'll get into later. It's oh, one of the best projects I've ever worked on. Freaking love it. So now we have locations and having great locations is super pivotal. If you have a boring location, it's not going to look good. If you'd have a boring set design, it's not going to look good. But for locations, you want somewhere that's super epic, that's pretty, and that gets great light. And there's so many things to keep in mind when choosing locations. You have to think about the direction of light so you don't end up being in shadows when you get there on set. Think about traffic and the noise, permits, travel time, weather, and logistics of bringing gear in. Sometimes you want to do this extravagant setup, but then you have to hike half a mile in. You have to think about that and say, like, okay, do we need more hands to bring stuff in or is talent going to have to carry this in? To, which you do not want to do. But the biggest thing about locations is being prepared. And a lot of people often do location scouts. And with location scouts, they're usually a part of projects where there's a very big budget. If the client can afford to send the DP and director to go out and find locations and find places to shoot for like a week straight, have a heyday. That sounds like a freaking blast. But oftentimes with these projects, we're either run and gun, just thinking about, okay, we're going to be in this general area. Let's shoot here. Or the client or the director has already picked out the locations in mind. And thankfully, oftentimes I've been to all these locations that I've been given. So if all else fails, I kind of have different spots spread around all over California in the areas that I normally shoot in. So if we're going to Big Sur, I always try to have a couple extra spots in mind in case we're running late and we're not able to get to the key spot for sunset. We're able to adapt and pick a different spot for sunset. That happened on the first Shannon shoot. And then there's oftentimes where there's logistics with things being late or you spend too much time in one area. So you always want to have a plan B and just to be able to think clearly adapt quickly and not freak out because if you start freaking out and getting crazy, you're going to lose a lot of valuable time and not be able to solve the problem efficiently. The last thing you want to do is to be scrambling around 
trying to find a spot for sunset when the light is ticking away. If you know you're gonna be late going to sunset, just commit to plan B and go to that location so you have enough time to set up and get the shots that you need. And the last thing about locations, I haven't really had to book anything yet for permits. I don't really have to take care of that. It's usually like a producer or the director or whatever. That's kind of the perk of being hit up by other people for these projects. They kind of hash out all the locations and logistics with that. I just show up and try to make pretty shots. It's pretty nice. And now the last thing you have to keep in mind for the pre-production is the deliverables. Figuring out your deliverables from your client will help you figure out exactly how you shoot your footage. I always recommend knowing the exact deliverables up front so you know how to price out and budget this project. If the client only wants 15 second cuts and you ask them time and time again, do you want a 60? Are you sure you don't want a 60? And they say no. Okay, I'll probably go a little bit crazier and not shoot shots as long as I normally would do for longer form stuff. But if they're going to have a mix of a 60 second and a 15 second and all of this, I'm going to shoot everything a lot longer than I need to or try to hold shots and make sure there's more usable footage throughout the entire thing but when it's shorter there's not as much pressure to like nail everything for like five seconds long most of the shots i end up using are at least one to two seconds long for the 15 second stuff so yeah once we dial in all of the concept briefs and the shot lists and storyboards and go through all the client calls and pre-production we can now as a dp start focusing in on production and this is my absolute bread and butter pre-pro is super important it's not really the most exciting thing sometimes but for me i actually want to get on set with a camera with a fun crew and go create stuff for these brands so the first thing i do with this entire project is think about my camera and lensing when it comes to gear I I want to be able to choose the right tool for the job. I want things to be minimal and simple and nimble and quick. And I don't want to be bogged down by gear and lens choices and camera supports and stuff if the job doesn't call for it. Of course, if the job calls for it, by all means, bring that stuff. With these types of short form projects, clients absolutely don't care what you shoot on. I've heard of people saying that clients ask if they shoot on RED or Sony or Canon. Maybe it matters if they've been around sets before and they want to have footage that matches their other stuff. By all means, shoot with those cameras that they kind of suggest or ask for. But the bare minimum that I've noticed nowadays is 4K 10-bit 422. That's all you need. And if you have good ND filters, good settings, and you know how to compose and frame up a shot and work with lighting and stuff, clients will be happy. If you make great images, they don't really care what it's shot on. And if it looks good and it fits their vibe and you deliver what they're looking for, they're going to be stoked. And that means that you're stoked. But for all these projects, my main choice of camera is the Sony FX3. And that's my main choice because that's the only camera that I own. It's great because you could strip it down or build it up with a big V mount. And you can have XLR mics and wireless mics and all the stuff on it. And it has great autofocus, great low light, all these things. And it's a really versatile tool for these types of jobs. For shoots where nimbleness and stealthiness is key, I'll run it basically how the camera came out of box. But if I'm going to be running around in the desert shooting all day, I probably don't want to have a big external monitor on it because it's going to be really heavy and get dirty and stuff. So I'll run a big rig with a V mount and then just expose off of the flip screen. But if I'm going to be in a studio all day, indoors, not really moving around much, I'm going to rig it out as big as possible because having that extra weight is nice for handheld shooting and having a big seven inch monitor just makes exposing and manual focusing a lot easier. There's always a tool and setup for the job. So I highly recommend experimenting with camera setups and camera bodies and seeing what works for those types of certain projects. But I pretty much have it down anytime I'm out running gun shooting where I know I don't have time to swap lenses and having a variety in shots is more important than having really pretty shots that are shot on primes, I'm shooting on a zoom and I have the Sigma 24 70 and the contact Zeiss 35 to 70, which was a recent pickup. And the Sigma is just the workhorse goaded lens for anything run and gun social media. It's not the most exciting lens, so I don't really reach for it as much anymore. But if I need autofocus for interviews or if I'm out running around knowing that I need autofocus, that's going to be my main choice. For the Shannon shoots that I did, the first one and the most recent one, that was all Sigma 24 70. But then I have the Contax Primes, which I use on the Chelsea shoot. And then I think I use Sigma 2470 on the Puma, Sigma 2470 on the Orca. And then I have a bunch of new shoots coming out hopefully soon that are all shot on contacts. I've just been loving the contacts lenses. The contacts 35 to 70 has been a sleeper pickup. It's been my new go-to, but for running gun shoots, having a zoom is so versatile because you're not wasting time setting your bag down, swapping lenses, and then on this camera, swapping NDs too, which kind of gets annoying. But then there's times where I'm in a set and I actually have time and maybe I can have an assistant at one point. 100% I'll shoot on the primes just because the character is just so rich and the primes are so small and gorgeous to work with but for the times that I'm solo operating and we're running on limited time I need to use a zoom and the 35 to 70 is a happy medium between my contacts primes and my segment 24 to 70. It's not too full of character but it's sharp enough especially when stopped down and it's just 
it's just more fun to shoot on, honestly. But yeah, lensing is just as important as your camera choice and you have to have the right lens for the job. It just is what it is. And right now the FX3 is the only camera I have, but I'll probably be adding a cinema camera very, very soon. So there'll be times where I choose that camera over the FX3. And there's times where I choose the FX3 over that camera. It just all depends. There's really no one perfect camera, but I think the FX3 is pretty damn close. So now let's talk about workflow. My workflow generally stays the same, whether it's a run and gun or a storyboarded shoot. For my run and gun shoots, it's normally myself and the director or photographer that are in charge of the video assets. And I say director slash photographer because a lot of the times I'm shooting alongside of photographer who happens to be the main source of contact between me and the client and then they're also directing the video piece too it's definitely a dance shooting between me and a photographer but i mean that's how all my projects have been these last few months so it just is what it is but then for the larger shoots it's not as hectic as running gun shooting there's definitely more structure to it and there's usually the client on set who has a director monitor so they can review footage and kind of dictate and tell me like kind of what to do but there's a lot of similarities between the larger sets and the smaller sets. For run and gun shooting, my mind is solely focused on variety. In my mind, my shot list goes wides, mediums, tights, statics, landscapes, dash, everything. I want to be able to build the entire scene in footage. Of course, when I'm there, I'm seeing everything, but if I'm not thinking about it, I often miss those key moments to be able to build out the edit. So every time we're shooting, I'm trying to get feet walking, people interacting, a wide of people looking out, being in the environment, mediums and close-ups of people's faces, talking and laughing, it, trying to cover everything with a variety of focal lengths and a variety of angles and the way the camera moves. Am I panning from left to right? Am I being static handheld? Is it on a tripod? Trying to have so much variety just allows me in the edit to just kind of take a breath and have stuff to work with. The worst thing is getting to an edit and being like, oh, all my shots are from the same angle and they're the same focal length. That's not fun to have. Being able to have a shot of bushes or a landscape shot as clouds are passing over or even a detail of like water moving. I'm always looking for textures and cool moments to be able to splice in to help tell the story more so. Especially in 15 seconds, you want to be able to have a couple shots in there to be like, oh, we're in the mountains right now. We're in the desert. We're in a backyard. It kind of helps build out more than just seeing talent interacting with product or with each other. Especially when you're in a location that's super pretty and the light is just hitting. I want to be able to film freaking everything. So I basically end up overshooting on every project, but it's nice because when I get into post, I have that flexibility with the different angles and I have the flexibility in choosing the best of the best instead of being stuck with the bare minimum. And that is one of the biggest things that I've learned about how to make better videos. So for the shoots that are more planned out where the client's more involved in the process, it actually makes my job a lot easier. I know a lot of people get skittish when clients get involved and all that, but honestly, it just makes a much better project because they know exactly what they want, especially when they have a shot shot by shot storyboard and shot list. You can just burn through that so quick and it just makes it a whole lot easier to get what you need and then you can get even more on top of that. But having that shot list allowed me just to get even more creative with the different types of shots and being able to zoom in a little bit more and having some details and vignettes of different locations in our set. And it was great because I had so much footage to pull from for all these deliverables to make a much better project, but then it ended up getting me more work from them in the long run. We'll touch on that later. So with these run and gun and planned out shoots, I have the same mindset while I'm on set. I want to be flexible, focused, and observant. I always want to be able to have camera up and ready. I'm focused. I know what's going on. So when something random happens, I want to be able to capture that to be able to have that for post for the deliverables. The worst thing to have is just to get your shot and be like, okay, I'm done and turn off your camera and just kind of like hang out. You're out in these crazy environments. You're shooting the stuff anyways. What's the difference between the stuff that you already got versus 30 minutes later when you're kind of still in that realm? You can get shots of people walking even though you're walking back to your car and stuff. Always having just that observant eye looking around at, well, oh, that's cool light, let's shoot over here. There's a cool landscape shot here, there's some details here. It just allows you just to have like an ongoing active thought process while you're shooting. At first doing run and gun stuff is super stressful. It's already hard enough trying to get the stuff that you need to get. But over time, as you keep working out that creative muscle, when you get on more of these sets and you don't really have a full plan <laughs> as you're walking into it, you start just to know like, okay, here's what I need to get. And then you end up surprising yourself every single time because you have all this variety in your shots and you have all this coverage that ends up just making the piece a whole lot better. And what's rad is that you can take those creative challenges and skills that you've learned from run and gun shooting and bring that over to the proper, more planned out sets. And even though they're all planned out and you have your shot list and everything, you can still be observant and see actions 
that are kind of different than the storyboard and be like, oh, can you rerun that action again? Can we do this? Can you interact with this? It's no different being on a bigger set versus a smaller set. You still have to have that creative eye looking out for those shots and compositions that will elevate your project. And then when things go wrong, it's not an if they go wrong, it's when they go wrong. You need to have a clear head. Don't freak out. Just be level headed thinking, okay, what do we need to do? What's important right here? And normally when things go wrong, it's based on logistics, whether it's getting to a location late or taking too much time at one location and then you're now late for another one. The main issue that I found is not allotting enough time to get from location A to location B to C. When there's traffic involved, or like I said, you're late from one to another, it ends up just being really stressful. So if you know you're going to be late, especially going to sunset, like I said earlier, have a plan B, have a backup plan. So you're not just wasting all your time driving during sunset and then you get there when it's dark and now you can't really shoot all the stuff that you need. So having that backup plan or even just getting to your sunset location like hours early, it's worth it to be there and to kick it and just like hang out, shoot a little bit, like whatever, and then be ready and refresh for when sunset hits and like the light starts hitting versus getting there late as sunset's already hitting and then trying to get everyone on the car and start shooting. That's just mayhem and chaotic and honestly not fun for everyone. But no matter what, you need to keep a level head, be flexible and continue to be a joy to work with. It's not fun when people are getting aggro and grumpy and weird with each each other embrace the suck embrace the things that go wrong it's not the end of the world you can adapt and when there's someone who's kind of leading that vibe everyone else kind of follows suit once people start freaking out everyone starts freaking out so that's the last thing you want on set keep good vibes keep everyone happy and yeah, just adapt. Running gun filmmaking and freelancing share a lot of the same things, mostly being inconsistencies and instability and just that roller coaster effect of things are up, things are down, and we're not really knowing what we're doing, but we're doing it. And you just have to embrace it. If you're not embracing that kind of lifestyle with freelancing, you're gonna have a really tough time having all these high expectations. And sometimes things go wrong, but that's just kind of all part of it. And lastly, the age old question for today's climate. Do you shoot horizontal or do you shoot vertical? It really just depends. I know people who like shooting only vertical vertical content for delivering vertical. It of course makes sense because you're using the full sensor for vertical, but then it's just a destructive workflow because if you want to use it in your reel or if the client wants it for their website or whatever, you can't really make that 16 by nine unless you crop in super far, which then it just doesn't really look good. So I personally like to have a non-destructive workflow where I shoot in 16 by nine with the nine by 16 aspect ratios on my LCD screen or monitor. So then I know I can at least frame in the important stuff in there or make sure that it's wide enough to where anything could fit in if I just like move it around and it allows me to crop for one by one, four, five, 16, nine, three, two, literally everything because I'm shooting horizontally. And it's nice because I can use it for my own reel or director's cut or whatever. And it's in a normal format that I use anyways. And I haven't really had any issues with this approach. My most recent project for Adidas and MLS, they only wanted nine by 16. And I still shot it in 16 by nine, just in case that they wanted a four, five or a one, one. I was just kind of banking on the fact that they're gonna ask for it in the long run. So so it really just depends on you and your decisions. I haven't had any issues with 16 by nine, but I know others who are more like TikTok purists will probably say like, I'm an idiot for shooting in 16 by nine for vertical, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much production. It's super straightforward, really minimal. I primarily shoot handheld and tripod. Most of the times I'm shooting handheld if I'm actually strapped for time, shooting run and gun, but I love shooting with an easy rig. I'd love to get one at some point. I use tripods for when I know there's time, like, okay, we got our shots. I'm just gonna get some establishing shots right now. And having tripod shots mixed in with handheld is just a really fun flow. I don't really use gimbals when I'm out on sets like that. I'll use gimbals very specifically. There's a project I did for New Balance that I'm hoping is released like today because I wanna put it in this edit for whenever this video comes out. But for two of the social cuts that I did, those were all handheld. And then for the third one, it was like a mix of just gimbal and then some handheld shots. So I very rarely use a gimbal. It's kind of nice to have here and there, but it's just kind of annoying having one camera trying to have it rigged up and then strip it down for a gimbal. I know people have a secondary camera to run a gimbal on. I don't really care about it. I love shooting handheld and tripods and there's a lot of options, but I try to keep things minimal, try to keep the gear kit low. If I know I'm going to be out at a set or like someone's house or studio or whatever, and I'm going to stay put, I'll bring my Nanook 935. But if I know I'm going to be out driving around, 
and away from my car, there's no way in hell I'm bringing my no note case and leaving a bunch of gear in there. I'll usually just pack a backpack and just run it out thin and then carry everything with me. I'm just super paranoid about stuff getting stolen. And when I'm out shooting, I'll just have the backpack on me and just run it like that. Or I'll set on the ground and I'll get a couple shots and then pick it back up and continue on. But essentially just have everything be minimal, have all your gear organized, keep things simple and just be focused. And I think you'll be fine. And then when I'm out shooting in the field, as I'm filming and getting variety and trying to get all these different compositions, I'm editing in my head. I'm thinking, okay, with this establishing shot here first, I can go that and then, okay, we have the shot of the people walking and then we have the reverse shot of that and then we can cut to a detail. I'm trying to build out these edits in my head as I'm filming. So then A, I know what to film next and a, B or whatever, like part two of that. I already know what I shot. Okay, that shot's good. I can get something different and move on to the next one. And then I also know for when I get home, I already know how this edit's gonna flow. So it's just constantly just being prepared time and time again, having that variety, being prepared to have a variety of angles and shots, and then being prepared for post. Already before I even ingest the footage, I know how these edits are gonna be built out. And that's even easier when you have pre-pro, when you have music in mind and the style in the flow of the piece. Just being prepared at the beginning makes each part of the stage a lot easier and easier as the process goes on. And then when production finally wraps and everyone says, that's a wrap and everyone celebrates and stuff, it's time to pack up go home. But before we get into post-production, a word from our sponsor. Thank you to the sponsor of this video, Musicbed. I've been using Musicbed for the last handful of years, and it's been my favorite place to find great music for my projects because they work with talented artists and musicians who are passionate about their work. They have a curated roster of over a thousand authentic and relevant artists like The Field Tapes, Layup, Icelandia, and everyone's favorite, Utah. They have over 40,000 songs available for licensing for any project. Finding music couldn't be easier with their browse and search tools built with filmmakers and creatives in mind. You can filter out songs based on their genre, their mood, and then they have advanced filters like BPM and key. This is my favorite method to finding the right song. I can fine tune the feel and vibe to make searching extremely quick. Musicbed also has a playlist page that hosts curated playlists ranging from your favorite filmmakers and creatives to various vibes and styles. It's such a great way to find new music pretty quickly. Some of my favorite playlists are What's New, Lo-Fi Hip Hop, Ambient, Step Studios, and of course, my own playlist. If you want to listen to some of my favorite songs, check out my playlist on Musicbed. Link in the description below. And even though you have all those amazing tools if you still need help finding the proper song for your video their team can help with complimentary song searches take your projects and films to the next level with musicbed hear the difference for yourself and sign up for a free account use code thomask22 at checkout to receive one month free when you purchase an annual subscription thank you again to musicbed for sponsoring this video So now it's time for post-production, the moment where everything all comes together and everything's shot. And if you missed stuff, you freaking missed it. Or if you nailed it, sick. Like you can't wait to color grade it and share the frames on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and stuff at me. But for me, most of the projects I take on, I am the DP, the assistant, first AC, colorist, editor, assistant editor, sound designer. I literally do everything, which comes with its bonuses and faults. So it all starts off with media organization. If you are not organized, you're going to have a very tough time when things get kind of towards the end, especially with revisions and having multiple timelines and stuff. And the first thing I do when I come home from a shoot, even if it's at two or three in the morning, is ingesting my footage. I'll immediately go to my computer, put the SD cards in, drop them to my SSD, and then to my archive drive on my desktop. I immediately want to dump those things onto a drive just to make sure nothing weird happens happens and that it's all backed up and ready to go for when I actually start working on it. And with my SSDs, I always organize it by the client. And then if it's a multi-day shoot, I'll do day one, day two, and day three, just to kind of make sure things are split up. Sometimes when I'm out on set, I'll have my computer with me. So when I'm at a hotel, I can like start dumping cards for each day, but sometimes I don't bring it. And then I just have to come home and then I'll just dump them into my footage folder. But I always organize my drives under the year. So 2022 client name. If it's like a certain project, it'll be like client name slash project name. Then I have my assets, exports, footage, and sometimes there's multiple cameras. So it'll be like Sony FX3 and then Sony CX150 and then Super 8 and all that stuff. I at least want to organize it by camera. I used to organize it by day. So like day one, day two, day three, day four, some sets and some productions, they like doing that. For me, I don't really care too much because I know everything's going in the same spot. As long as everything's on the drive and organized by those main things, you're pretty much good to go. And after my folder on my SSD is all set up, now it's time for DaVinci 
resolve. And I found a pretty good folder structure that ends up working out every single time for my projects. And it goes like this. I make my footage folder with the respective cameras and then days. And then after that, I have my select spin, music, assets, graphics, logos, timelines, sound effects, GFX. I try to keep everything organized in the same place. Having a clean and organized drive and project file will make life so much easier, especially once you start dumping things in and duplicating timelines and having all these different versions and all these assets going into it. If you have a very messy system, it's gonna be a pain in the ass to try to find footage from day two on location two when in reality you can just organize it up front at least by day if you want to and then find it there or if you have it color coded and resolve or organized by day and resolve you can find it there easier as well and then once all the footage is in and all the assets and graphics and everything are all in DaVinci Resolve now it's time for pulling selects and I made a video a couple years ago about my entire pulling selects process if you want to check that out I'll leave the link in the description below and since then I've kind of changed my workflow up a little bit so I'll make an update video to that but essentially if you follow that video it'll pretty much be the same thing as what I'm doing now. I always, always, always dig through every square inch of footage. I know people who will just have all their footage live in a bin. And then as they're editing, they'll just like scroll through that bin looking for files. And it none of it makes any sense because there's so much footage in there and you don't like you have to find all the good parts. So essentially, I'll just either dump all my footage into a timeline or I'll use the cut tab in DaVinci Resolve and just start cutting out all the good stuff up front. So that's kind of the workflow I've been doing now, especially with the Resolve Speed Editor. I just like watch it in out drop in out drop in out drop and i look through literally everything and i dump it on my selects timeline so then i know everything in this is good to go it's all the usable stuff and once i start actually using it i'll just drag it from layer one to layer two or layer three lately i've been doing layer three as used and then layer two is like oh this is the best of the best so then at least like when i'm building out the edit i can look back at that and see oh these ones haven't been used these ones are used and then these ones are the best of the best that i should use the last thing i want to do is deliver a project and be like uh oh i missed my absolute favorite shot for this and the client would have loved it just because I was lazy and didn't want to look through all of my footage. So you just never know what you'll find in there. Sometimes you'll find fun whip pans and stuff and you want to be able to have all the usable stuff at the ready so you can actually have a good foundation to build your edits off of. And that's where the bonus of being the filmer and the editor comes into play because you just know your footage already because you were the one that shot it all. It's just another bonus to get familiar with the footage. So when I start editing, it can be a lot quicker trying to find stuff because I already have that shot in mind because when I shot it I already know that this piece could go after this one and so on and it just makes it a lot easier and then next up is music and it's funny because music bed asked to sponsor a video of mine and I was really excited about it because music is such a huge part of the creative process and every time I get a project from someone I'm always asking what kind of music do you want what kind of genre are you looking for what kind of pace are you looking for the vibe the feel and everything and I always try to push to get music up front and it's always a mission but I'm pushing and pushing and pushing to get them to at least look through the music bed library and up front just ask hey can you just look through this library here's the music bed link can you please look through this and just let me know if you have any questions it's super easy to find music just type in the vibe you're looking for and make a playlist and send it over to me and not many people have done it so it's kind of a bummer but at least music bed makes it so much easier to find music i'm always pushing to do music bed because they actually have high quality music and i think it's just so much more worth it when you have good music accompanied by good visuals and storytelling and all that and then once we get music locked it's time to start building and even if we don't have the music locked in per se we still build based off of vibe and feel with editing it's always tough to start off with a blank canvas but once you get the ball rolling you notice it's a lot easier to start building out and just fleshing out the edit the thing is that every single time draft one is gonna suck so you might as well just get started with it the main hiccup for me is just staring at the blank canvas and trying to make perfection on the first time around and I noticed that once I start just plopping footage into the timeline Line and start kind of organizing and building it out. It's like, oh, like there's actually flow being built with this and like there's a structure starting to happen. And that initial 5% is the toughest part of editing, just actually starting. So I always recommend just start throwing stuff in, pick your favorite shots, start throwing them in and then build around them. And what's nice is that it doesn't really have to be good because once there's an actual structure and foundation being built, you can start replacing shots and taking them away and shortening them and adding them. But if you have the songs already, just plop your song down. I always try to build out my song first so if it's a 15 second cut 
trim it to 15. I, I'll mess around with like the beats and everything and cut them on the beats and kind of shorten things up if I want to have like the start of the song and then the middle of the song and then the end of the 15 seconds will be from the actual end of the other song. But like I said with pulling selects, having the best of the best on layer two, just start throwing those into the timeline and you'll start to see this structure being built out. And that initial starting point is the toughest, but once you get past that, things just get easier and easier. And then you'll notice that version one is like kind of all right. And then two is better then three is even better. And then when it comes to actual timelines, I always make a folder for each style of deliverable. So if I have Instagram reels or a full length web one or gifts or anything, I always try to organize it in that. And when it comes to the naming structure, I always have the client name underscore the type of it. So if it's a reel, if it's a long form, I usually just call it full and then underscore oh one for version one, then two and three. It really just depends. Sometimes if you're trying to keep track of products, it makes sense to name it under the product name, but I always do underscore v1 and then when i go to the next revision i keep that timeline duplicate it turn it to v2 and then continue on i always want to have a paper trail of all of my timelines so if the client's like oh we actually changed this can we go back to that it's an easy fix and i'm not having to dig through my selects trying to find that exact same shot so i always try to run a non-destructive workflow no matter what i'm doing whether it's in the organization of pulling selects or the actual timelines I'm trying to make sure everything is organized and neat so when I know, okay, this version's done, duplicate it, underscore final, call it good. But one of the biggest things you could do with the editing process is to rest your eyes. When you're just staring at a computer for eight hours, just trying to edit this stupid project <laughs> and you're just so used to it and you're just annoyed or whatever, things not working, go take a break. And it seems counterintuitive to step away from the project, but when you go and go for a run or surf or lift weights or go for a hike or a walk or whatever, you come back refreshed because you did something fun and productive or whatever, but you're also away from that project for a while. And maybe you were thinking about it while you were doing that activity or you weren't even thinking about it. It. Either way, you come back with new and fresh eyes. And sometimes if you want to build out the first version of the edit and then just like leave it at that and then work on something else and then like call it a night and then resume it later in the week, that's also a really good thing too, especially if you have the time. But sometimes we don't have the luxury of time when it comes to delivery. Sometimes it's like a week if we're lucky couple weeks, but having that time in between is huge because you come back to it with new eyes and you're like, oh, this sucks. Or like, oh, like that's actually pretty good. Why was I stumped with this? And just that little bit of a break can really make or break obstacles that are going on in our head when it comes to editing. And then my favorite part of the whole editing process is color grading. And color grading is just so much fun because you spent all this time editing, you're listening to the music, you're listening to the sound and everything going on. And then now you're able to actually listen to music or a podcast or a YouTube video and just color. And it's so fun because for me, color grading doesn't take that much time. I try to keep things really minimal and simple. Like a lot of the things I do in the whole filmmaking process, and I still try to keep the color style and the vibe of the client paired up with my style with coloring. And it ends up just being really nice and easy because a lot of people like the low contrast look that I do. And every time I deliver out V1 for review, I'll always just do a quick color pass, usually just like minor, minor tweaks with the levels and then having Rex 709 lens, throwing on my grain stuff. And then when it gets to like actually locking in the cut, that's when I dive into color because I don't want to do all this coloring on it and then replace a shot in version three. It just doesn't really make any sense. And then for me, color grading, I'm not doing too many qualifiers or masks or anything because frankly, it's not really needed. A lot of the stuff I do is just super minimal, just levels in the shadows, highlights, midtones, kind of adjusting the roll off a bit, adjusting saturation, adding grain and tweaking the sharpness and stuff. Most of these clients don't really care about like masking and stuff. Of course, if there's like a certain product I need to show off, if I'm doing like a studio setting, I'll probably put a mask on like a candle or whatever, but more often than not, it's not needed. I've never been asked for it. And then lastly, once the color is locked in, I'll dive into sound. And sound design is such a funky thing because it's a whole art in itself. But for me, I try to move away from like the cliche sounds and having sounds stick out too far than what they need to be. But essentially for me, sound design, I wanna have minimal ambient noise. So if I'm doing sound design for a scene that's out in the mountains, I'm not gonna have like the cliche birds chirping and stuff. I'll try to like hide that really far under if my sound design pack has birds chirping. So Sometimes when I'm out on set, I'll bring my Zoom H4 and get some Foley and just some audio of the scene, but it's not too hard to do that at home either. So I often just like save that for when I get home. I'm not too stressed out about having like this whole sound design set up per shot. Sometimes just having that sound go in between shots is helpful. And then if you dip it or like pan it to the left or the right, just doing fun little stuff like that can really elevate your sound design and not have it feel so stale and forced. I always save sound for last because if I end up changing my shots and changing 
changing the edit, it's a complete waste of time. So I say that for the very bitter end. If I do sound design first before I even get confirmation from the client, I just wasted all that time up front when that could have just been spent towards editing and getting the flow dialed in. And then for exporting, it's pretty self-explanatory. I'll kick out at the resolutions and codecs that the client prefers. But if they don't request anything, I'll just do H.264. For 9x16, I'll do 1080 by 1920. For 4x5, it'll be 1080 by 1350. 16x9, I always just do in 4K. I mean, I could make the 4K equivalents for the other ones, but it's all going on Instagram, so it doesn't really matter anyways. And then for export, this goes for the same for revisions. I always send it up to Frame.io under the client folder, under that project folder. So for Shannon, I already had one in 2020, 2021. That was their winter shoot. So I have their winter shoot on there. And then next to that, I have their 2022 summer shoot. And then I always have folders for reviews and then finals and stacking them on top of there. And I always, always, always ask a client to share their notes on Frame.io. Sometimes they don't, but if they're really nice, they will tell you the timestamps in an email, which I mean, it's basically the same thing, but it's really nice having in Frame.io. And then when it's time for delivery, I'll make a finals folder, submit it to them. So then they're not getting mixed up with version three and four and one and all that. They have the exact final versions in that one folder and then they can download that and they're on their way. Sometimes you get clients that request more work. Once all the main deliverables that you agreed upon are sent out, they're like, hey, we loved all your footage. Do you have any more? And the joy of overshooting is that you could say, yes, I have tons of footage that we could work with. For example, for the Shannon shoot, I gave them five Instagram reels to choose from because we had like five main locations, even though the delivery said three. So I said, okay, here's five, just pick three. And they picked three and then they were kind of off with it, but they didn't request any more, but they had the option to buy the other two. So I kind of gave them that option up front, like, hey, like we have tons of footage. Do you want to use it all? Because you paid for us to get out there. We did all his work and this kind of just goes like under the radar and unused. But for Baby Leto, they were smart about it because they were able to see on my monitor exactly everything that I shot. And then they were like, hey, can we customize stuff for our Mother's Day thing? Can we customize it for this cabinet or this whole collection instead of just that one single crib? So I was able to do like six to 10 more edits for them and I just worked one-on-one -on -one with them with that and sending them the revisions and getting all that dialed in with the pricing and stuff but it's cool because if i didn't overshoot or like be cognizant about what i was shooting and like shooting extra i wouldn't have gone that extra work out of it so it just makes sense having that extra footage and just going above and beyond we'll have these clients come back asking for more and it was rad to do that extra work with baby leto because it was a win-win for both of us i was able to get more work out of it kind of build more relationship with them because i'm communicating with them more and then making them happier for a second time after the initial delivery of the assets. And it's a win for them because they're getting customized assets with the footage they already paid for. They're just paying a little bit extra for an editing fee. So it'd be a shame to do another shoot for that stuff when they already have that footage shot from a previous shoot. So that's pretty much all of it from start to finish. And it's a really fun process. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Leave a like down below if you did. If you have any questions about the entire process, any specifics or anything vague or whatever, just send me a DM. Leave a comment on here as well if you have those questions. And if you like these types of videos, please consider subscribing. So with all that, if you guys wanna check out some of the work I've done over these last couple of years, I'll leave some links down in the description below to some of the social work that I've done. And yeah, I'll leave you guys with my favorite piece that I've done in the last couple of years. Peace.